Okay, Mindset by Design crew. Well, you've had my awesome intro, so you definitely know how excited I am about this guest today. And you also know that we're going off topic from a lot of the things that you're used to, but if we're gonna do this, then to be honest, there's only one man in the world that we can do it with, and it's Mr. Dennis McKenna. How are you, sir? I'm well. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, it's it's been I've been um, listening to especially yourself and, and your brother for a long, long time, and probably for the past like close to ten years. When I was living in New Zealand, I got introduced to to you through actually through the psychedelic cafe. And ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So so there was hours and hours of Terence's um, yeah Terence's talks back then. I mean, you mean the psychedelic salon? Psychedelic salon. What am I saying? The psychedelic yeah. cafe. You're absolutely right. It's, yeah. Lorenzo Haggerty. Lorenzo. Yes. Yeah. Good old Lorenzo. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of the, <laughs> lot of the Burning Man. Um, yeah, a lot of the Burning Man topics and all the rest was out there. Well, have you done Burning Man yourself? You know, it's I have not. I mean, it's it's the big shame of my life. Actually, <laughs> I haven't done it yet. Uh, I came close. Really? Uh, a few years ago, I was in Peru the week before I was supposed to go there, and wow. I got some kind of an intestinal infection that turned out to be uh, really bad. And I figured this was the last place I wanted to go. If you've got di- you know. <laughs> projectile diarrhea and vomiting it's it's you don't want to be up on the playa when that's happening you know. so i aborted the whole thing and i have not been i haven't been able to get back since you know, it's uh, probably maybe a good thing now i think it's changed so much right i know that um we had um i think it was kanye west there was it, i think last year or something sad like that you know so things have rover changed. norquist was there last year too really yeah, yeah. Wow. So I think it's changed. I, I'd like to go. It's one of these things that I'd like to put it on the map, but right. I'm not really. I'm not. I guess if I was really that motivated, I would already have been there. So <laughs> I'm sort of like, when the opportunity comes, right. I'll do it. Right. It's not at the top of my list. I can I got, see this. You got other things going on. I get yeah, that. I get yeah. that. I get that. I mean. Well, I mean, a great place to start is probably in society. I mean, do you, do you have over the years, I mean, you've been involved in this game for a long, long time. One of the, probably the most experienced people on the planet uh, changing your altered state through plant medicine. I mean, have you seen a, a, like a, a renaissance with, with, with this, if you want to use that word? Have you seen from the 60s to 2014 and 15, have you seen a big shift in the culture? Of, oh yeah, people yeah, no doubt about it. I've, I've seen a big shift <clears throat> in the culture over, well, as you say, I really have been into this <laughs> since the late 60s, right. and it never really went away, but it certainly right. went through stages where for a long time it was something, you know, in the 70s and 80s, right. you couldn't really talk about it much, and that's partly why my brother was so brave and in a certain sense kind of foolhardy or maybe <laughs> foolish to discuss right. all of this so openly very openly you know <laughs> all through that time but i have to say i really have to credit him because he he kind of almost single-handedly kept this idea alive kept it a topic of conversation really even if a kind of forbidden one or or you know mm-hmm. but it was there and and then Things have begun to open up, and uh, I think a number of things have, have contributed to that. For one thing, uh, you know, we're, we've matured as a culture, right. right? And we've had psychedelics in our culture now since really the early 60s, and they've been part of mass culture, right. and we've learned stuff. We have had a time, 40 years or more, mm-hmm. to develop you know, we borrowed heavily from indigenous people and right. and all that, but we've developed our own tradition in a certain sense, which incorporates a lot of indigenous indigenous practices. But it's not the same, and it shouldn't even try to be the same. Right? You know, because we're not indigenous people, but we are learning from the traditions of indigenous people 
and our own, you know, sort of experimental approach to it, and uh, mm. and I would say from the from the substances themselves or the plants themselves, Definitely. you know, indigenous people have this uh, notion that you know they call them plant teachers, right? You know, right. and in in the ayahuasca tradition, they're plant teachers, and they are in fact teachers. You know, mm. you can learn from them, you can learn. From direct experience mm -hmm. and with psychedelics there's no substitution for that you know you can learn directly essentially how to use these substances right. they they will they will you know they will teach you or you will learn yeah. let's put it that <laughs> one way or because, another right yeah i mean you psychedelic experience is one of these things that you really can't you, you can't delegate somebody to do it for you. It, the whole essence of the whole thing is the right. interface between the individual and the experience. And everyone's experience is different because right. everyone is an individual. And so, uh, you know, but we're not so afraid of them as we were in the 60s we have a better knowledge base right. and also in the 60s when they got to be widespread in society there was a lot of hysteria about you know they were going to get out and ruin our children and right. all that right well that's already happened and you know <laughs> civilization hasn't collapsed it's yet funny that, isn't it yeah you know? and if it does collapse it won't be because of that for you sure. know i mean it's, for sure you know so, so we've learned things at the same time. Um, so we've we've got that aspect of it, but then at the same time, it's getting a lot more notice. These substances are getting more notice right. in the in the mainstream uh, media or whatever that they're not so terrible, and in fact, they may be beneficial. And and right. and what's what's opening that up is some pretty good science is being done on these things now. So mm -hmm. anytime you can put the imprimatur of science on something controversial like mm -hmm. that, it's sort of like, you know, it legitimizes it in some way. Right. You know, and we, we can have the conversation as to whether science itself is legitimate, but <laughs> in our culture we do accept it, you know. They so that's a whole other other mm -hmm. topic to, to think about, but uh, so, uh, you know, when these things first started to come out, particularly LSD, mm -hmm. back in the, in the 50s mm -hmm. and in the 60s to a certain, to, for a certain time until, until they be, began to alarm people, you know, but right. when, the, when LSD was the, you know, the, the plaything of, of clinicians and physicians and philosophers and people like right. that, there was great interest, great hope that these things had therapeutic uses. Sure. Quite a lot of research was done. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Back in the 60s, uh, a great many, uh, you know, publications appeared in the scientific literature with LSD, primarily with LSD for things like alcoholism and, right. you know, recidivism in prisoners and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Not necessarily well done studies. A lot of them were, you know, the standards for studies back then were different. But now we've got a new generation who grew up in a world where, yeah, if you're going to do a clinical study, it has to be very rigorous, right? right? It has to be highly structured, well designed, or or it won't be taken seriously. It won't get funded. But we've got a new generation of people who know how to do that, and right. they're carrying out these studies, and they, so they can't be faulted in terms of their scientific, you know, their experimental design or their scientific integrity, right. and data is data, and that's the whole idea of science, that you, you get objective observations that, you know, can be put to the test. Uh, you know, ideally, science works for some hypothesis, and, right. and you know, the hypothesis with psychedelics is something as simple as well. These these things can benefit uh, people with uh, PTSD or depression or Absolutely. addictions or any a number of things that that 
they're being used to to treat now. I mean, it's getting profound, profound results in people, though. Even while you're talking about LSD, yeah. I know that like close, like near death, like people who are close to that death, it's completely changing their fear and their perception around 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 well the afterlife or whatever you want to call whatever you want to call that next stage. You know. And right, it's, it's pretty. It's pretty amazing. I mean, you were talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, and I know because I obviously do neurolinguistics, and that helps. But then, like psychology and everything, are going for a long time, like going over these patterns, and they're still not getting the results. And then people are doing like um, MDMA therapy, and within a couple of sessions, that post-traumatic stress disorder literally it, it, it's released, it's vanished. I mean, are people like you're talking about with science, is this really be coming into the mainstream now because of um, because people are literally backing that science and then there's funding going into it? Because I know there's a whole huge revolution revolution. <laughs> I can use that rude word revelation with uh, with cannabis now in, in the in the US and the, CB, right. and the CBD side. I mean, how do you feel about how do you feel about all of that? I mean, is it is it, are we going in the right direction with it all or? No, I do. I, I think we are going in the right direction. Uh, you know, when and and the idea of cannabis, the example of cannabis is is a good example because here we've had a an herb, a plant that's literally been around forever, and there was so much misinformation and so much fear and so much sort of persecution of this thing. My God, it's it's simply an herb. Why is everybody so excited about this? Right, you know, right. uh, and, and so we've I think we've matured, and people were saying, "Well, yeah, it doesn't seem to be that harmful, and there are obviously some benefits to it." So mm -hmm. it's just interesting that conversation has changed, mm -hmm. and uh, people are recognizing it to the point of saying, "Well, uh, you know, um, I mean, the people are for it." Who are you know on the promotional side are saying, well, um, yeah, wonderful. It's 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 therapeutic. It's useful. Uh, it's recreational, and and as a species, we like recreational substances. Sure. Uh, and the people that were formerly against it are sort of saying, well, maybe it's not so bad after all. You know, it <laughs> right. does appear to have some benefits, and if you look at the uh, you know the abuse potential of this on the spectrum of all abusable substances, right. whatever that means. Uh, it's not that terrible. So no. why don't we just ease off a little? And that seems to be what's happening slowly. slowly. But society is slow to change, you know, especially on these issues. And yeah, and you so. see somewhat the same thing happening with with the psychedelics. Mm. Uh, I don't, you know. It, it's going to be a long time before the government funds this stuff. I mean, they, they've spent 40 years saying all these things are terrible, all these substances are terrible. They can't pivot now and say, oh, actually, they're great, and we're going to put millions of dollars into research on these right. things. Right. So does but that eventually they might, but at first it's got to be nonprofits like MAPS and Hefter well, that, yeah. that do this research. So... Uh, don't get the uh, miss. Don't don't get the impression that this is breaking out all over. It's not. It's still a very small bunch of people who are working with gotcha. basically no funding. But gotcha. we're we're changing the perception. That's and, beautiful. And the internet's yeah. doing a beautiful job to to help shift that consciousness, right? It, yeah, it, it really is. I mean. I mean, so so we'll talk about Hefter and, and Maps in a minute because I'm really fascinated with that because I know you're really involved with, with that side and that's a beautiful thing. I mean, how did I mean is Straussman with the DMT trials? Are they are they getting direct funding? Do you have any involvement or do, do you know Dr. Straussman or? Well, I yeah, I know Rick Straussman yeah. pretty well. Right. Uh, I, I don't know what he's up to now. I don't know if he's doing any clinical studies uh, now, but I thought he they were. okay. Is he? I, that's right. what I thought, but hey, I might be wrong. So I'll have to confirm that, right? I'll have to confirm. That. Well, early nineties, I think he did his. I think he did his DMT study in about nineteen ninety three. Oh wow! And he hasn't done a lot of that. He's written a, a few books since right. then. He hasn't done any more clinical work since then. Ah. You know, but to his credit, he has. Uh, he opened up the door again. He opened the door and it, he was really the catalyst, you know, to right. the 
revival to the resurgence of this psychedelic That's work. Beautiful. And, you know, I mean, I have to say, behind the scenes, Terrence and I have to take credit for some of what Rick did because, sure. you know, he was a good friend of both of us and he oh. would come around and we'd sit around and talk and, you know, typical conversation was sitting around crying in your beer. Why can't we do research on psychedelics? How terrible, <laughs> you know. And both Terry and I said, well, Rick, you know, you're an MD. You're a psychiatrist. Right. You have all the qualifications to do this. Why don't you just go fucking do it, <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, well, actually, you know, you're right. I think I will. And so, That's so cool. he, you know decided he applied to the FDA for <clears throat> to do a clinical study mm -hmm. went through all the paperwork did all the all the hoops that you have to jump through he jumped through and they said okay you know you got a good protocol here so uh, so you can do it and and that was really the start of it wow. the FDA is not our enemy you know okay, they they actually base their decisions based on more on science than on politics and uh, if you got a good scientific protocol the, and it's safe they're, they're looking for safety and effectiveness right. if you right. can show it's safe and maybe effective that right. usually comes in in the next phase uh, then yeah you could do these studies and uh, you know I think I think one thing that helped Rick at that time was that he wanted to do a clinical study with DMT. Right. He had been working on serotonin physiology and melatonin and pineal gland stuff right. for a while, and so he wanted to do this study with DMT, but he didn't have a therapeutic uh, agenda. He wasn't saying it cures this oh, or that. Oh, I see, I see. He was just saying... I want to understand how this stuff works in right. the body and in the brain. So almost like an observational study, we're not saying it's good for anything. We're just saying what we want to understand how it works. Right. And so the FDA was receptive to that. Well, so, now, of course, some of these studies are coming on and mm -hmm. they do have therapeutic goals or Absolutely. therapeutic rationales Absolutely. Uh, but Rick opened the door and for that I mean the man's a real pioneer for no sure. doubt about it but you, yeah. you pioneered first you guys both of you you know and that's the thing yeah but we didn't have the imprimatur of government <laughs> it was approval. testing <laughs> right. yeah 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 fact, it was seeing what opposite. happened it was funny <laughs> so so that's the so what's the we're talking about the clinical studies we're going back in that direction which is beautiful so how does how does Hefter? I mean, what's their, what's and maps? How do they? It, what's the what's the outcome? What's the vision for them? What are you trying to achieve with that? Because obviously, um, Rick was trying to just simply, you know, see what happened. I mean, but right. what, what 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 are you guys trying to do? Well, the way it's played out, uh, and there's not any real plan behind it, but okay. it's just the way it seems to have evolved. Is that for one thing, maps is a lot bigger than Hefter, a lot more visible than Hefter, right. and much better funded than Hefter. I right. mean, I'm, I'm sort of happy that they're funded, but I wish we were better funded, but we'll get to that. We will get to that. Uh, and, and also, they're much more politically active, active in a certain sense. I mean, they're right. active in medicinal cannabis, for example, and, right. and things like that. And just sort of the way it's played out uh, MAPS has ended up focusing mostly on MDMA oh, interesting. you know if, if they staked out a compound and sort of said this is our territory not that they're being territorial but if they and they want to they want to uh, <coughs> they want to use it in the treatment of PTSD right and it turns out it's probably the perfect medicine for for treating PTSD more than a regular psy psychedelic like LSD or right. or psilocybin or right. even ayahuasca, um, because just because of the nature of of what it is, it it is and it some of the sometimes uh, people with PTSD they have a psychedelic experience so they can get re-traumatized. Oh, you know, they they confront the experience and. It puts them right back in that place. Mm -hmm. MDMA can also do that. It helps them to relive or re 
work through whatever it was that traumatized them, but there's an element of lot, no anxiety about it. It puts them at a certain emotional re remove from it, Gosh. so they can look at these traumas, but they're not re-traumatized. So the, the, that also might observe that third-party perspective, they're able to actually see themselves in it, and so they're able to actually change that, 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 that visual component, right? Yeah, but they gotcha. can stand back from it. It's not gotcha. like they're going through it again. Gotcha. They can examine it and say, "Oh, this is the this is what happened, and this is what I need to." So it gives you a certain perspective on that that the other psychedelics don't. Uh, gotcha. You know, and so and uh, maps and Rick Doblin's agenda, and I think it's a legitimate one. Is they want eventually. MDMA to be approved as a, a medicine to treat uh, PTSD Good. and possibly other things. But in order to do that, it's going to have the schedule is going to have to change. It's going to have to be put in a, a less restrictive schedule than Schedule One. <laughs> yeah, it helps. Well, right? It should <laughs> never have been there in the first no, place. Of course, none of these things should have. No. But MDMA is an example of. Uh, you know, it was it was legal until uh, you know about 1984, that right? and then the DEA reviewed it, and they had their administrative law judge review it. You're probably familiar with all that, for sure. And that law judge recommended that it should be put in uh, Schedule Three or Four, a pretty non a schedule that would make it easily right. easy to use clinically. Absolutely. And the DEA totally ignored that. And, said, oh, it's got to be in Schedule 1, you mm. know. Why do you and think so that there is? was, you know, that what? shut down a lot of therapy yeah. that was going on. Do you think that that's time. the pharmaceutical side that's kicking in? Do you think it's all about money? Do you think this is like the, because obviously what we can talk about, I'd love to like get your opinion of, of what's happening with like other drugs for, for other psychedelics and suicide and for other types of treatments. And we'll, we'll talk about that with Hefner because I'm fascinated, you know. And everyone out mm -hmm. there listening, you need to, to get onto this because it, the end of the day, this 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 flow, this consciousness, this is what's happening with all these psychedelics, this this treatment, it's not going away, it's just getting greater. So it's as the as as the culture evolves, guess what? Well so does so does this treatment and and so does the results because this is really just like um, it's just happening again because there's so much fun then. I know with, with for example, even with, with cannabis I personally, it, I've seen some incredible results in, in California around this, you know, with health issues that nothing else, nothing else happens. And I know that means that, like, I know that Bill Gates and people and uh, have just put money in. They're starting to fund this now because they don't care what it is. They just see a, a big business. So do you see, yeah. that, see that happening with, like, uh, MAPS and Hefta? And do you see this happening with all the type of psychedelics? Yeah. So as 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 maps basically what I'm trying to say are they being clever by by um, focusing on one specific thing for one specific treatment that then they can open up the door for other things or what do you feel? Yeah, I think I mean that's obviously one way to do it. You've got right. to focus on one thing. Right. Once you get this substance approved for that use, then you open up the possibility to off-label uses. Right. You know, in other words. You can, you know, it's easier to use it for something that's not officially uh, approved, but, you know, it's, and, and this happens with drugs all the time, all sure. kinds of drugs are used for off-label uses. Right, uh, right. And, and the same thing is happening with psilocybin, and psilocybin is kind of the one that, that uh, Hefter staked out, or, or oh, okay. again, by default, it's just because the kind of it's because for one thing we didn't want to get involved with MDMA right. research because MAPS was doing a lot of it, right. and some of our Hefter people have reservations about MDMA mm -hmm. uh, around the potential toxicity issue and all that. We don't really think it's we don't really think it's neurotoxic, but in some circles there is a perception. That it might be so in right, some ways, and that. it's not a true psychedelic. MDMA is little different pharmacologically than psilocybin or LSD in what, or in DMT. What way? In what way? The psilocybin I know is very, very close to neurotransmitters, right? It's very, it's very close. Right. It's it has to do with how how it works in 
in the brain. Uh, gotcha. MDMA <clears throat> works on serotonin. Gotcha. But it works presynaptically. It works uh, on the what's called the serotonin transporters, okay. which are the uh, proteins in the in the synapse. You know, gotcha. the synapse is yep. the junction between two nerve cells. Right. And in the in the presynapse, their <clears throat> neurotransmitters are packaged into little membrane-bound uh, bubbles, essentially okay. called vesicles. Okay. When the nerve impulse comes along, those those vesicles uh, fuse with the membrane. The neurotransmitter diffuses into the synaptic gap. Gotcha. Floats over to the receptive the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, right? Okay. Binds to those receptors and then elicits the effect. And all of the true psychedelics, LSD, DMT, all of these work that way. They interact with a particular population, a particular subtype God. of serotonin receptors postsynaptically. MDMA works differently. It mm. works presynaptically on this thing, the little protein in the presynaptic membrane called the serotonin transporter okay. and the serotonin transporter is a, is a pump that essentially think of it as a vacuum cleaner it sucks back all the serotonin from the synapse or some portion of it right. and repackages it and reuses it right gotcha. so gotcha. that serotonin transporter is what the SSRI type antidepressants target right right they jam it closed so that you can this is a way to think of it is the SSRIs jam this transporter closed right. so the serotonin is not sucked back in so there's a higher level in the synapse right so it time. keeps it keeps it keeps yeah. it packaged gotcha gotcha and that and that keeps you Feeling that good. makes you feel good right because yeah, serotonin happy. makes you feel good yeah. MDMA does just the opposite it jams it open <laughs> right okay that's so gotcha. all the serotonin leaks out of the synapse and your your brain is flooded with serotonin so it's not really the drug that's getting you high it's the serotonin euphoria that is the that is the mdma state you know gotcha. where you just your brain is massively flooded with you know our feel-good neurotransmitter gotcha. and very different kind of mechanism of action totally different. Uh, but the others work pre they work post synaptically in that way that i just described to right you. that's a totally yeah. different experience it's a totally different that's why you see a lot of people i suppose that's the fear with with hefta right because working with the mdma although it's a beautiful thing it can also cause that depression because you're getting serotonin depletion and you're getting those other things right so so there's mm -hmm. consequences right there's no free meal yeah. right there's no free meal right. mm, interesting. yeah you do get you do get temporary ser serotonin depletion with mdma right. which you can minimize if you you know with dietary things and that right. sort of if you eat a lot of 5-HTP, you For can sure. quickly regenerate you know, your For serotonin sure. levels. Gotcha. But they're, they're similar, but they both work on serotonin, but they work on it in a different way. But they both have you know, therapeutic properties. For, uh, sure. For sure. The psychedelics, well, so psilocybin. Psilocybin, psilocybin yeah. seems to be, again, not by any well thought through strategy or anything it just this is the way it happened we've settled on psilocybin because psilocybin is the perfect uh clinical psychedelic in a certain sense it's easy to handle mm -hmm. relatively easy at, at the doses that are used it can get yeah. Can get quite gnarly. Not the heroic doses. five grams. Not the heroic five grams that right, you guys right. used to do, but, right? <laughs> but at, at lower doses, it's it's relatively easy to manage in a in a clinical setting. Right. Uh, it's compatible with human biochemistry. Mm -hmm. it, it's not toxic in any way. Uh, it's fairly short acting, but long enough to actually have some. You know, a window unlike DMT, which is short acting, right? But so short acting that 
it, you can't get much out of it therapeutically other than what the fuck was that you know <laughs> i mean it's 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 totally overwhelming right and, and it will produce a, a mystical experience and sure. ecstasy and all that but but not insight so much mm -hmm. other than just this general sense of astonishment that my god this this is you know my god that's about all you can <laughs> say god. people come back say you can say more, uh, yeah. you know, uh, have more insightful things to say with psilocybin or sure. ayahuasca, which is essentially, both of these things are DMT right. in a certain sense. Chemically, they're re related to DMT. Psilocybin, too. But they're, they're, Yeah, psilocybin mm. is actually converted in the body to a compound called psilocin. And that's the active form of psilocybin. Oh, and wow. psil psilocin... Okay. Is one atom different than DMT? You know, oh, wow, it's, wow, wow. I don't know if you're a chemist. No, but, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, well, suffice it to say that it's just slightly enough different that it's orally active, which DMT is not. Right, right. That's why it requires the monoamine oxidase right. inhibitor in right. ayahuasca. Right. DM, uh, psilocybin doesn't require that, it's orally active on its own. And it's stretched out to, you know, six to eight hours, which is right. just about the ideal length of time. And uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not toxic at all. And generally, the psychedelic experience is fairly easily managed, you know. So it's a good adjunct to therapy. You can, right. you can learn a lot from it just by focusing on your inner state. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can actually have a therapist and talk to the therapist, and that that can be useful. And in these clinical studies, there there's usually a bit of this and a bit of that. You know, right. that it's not one or the other. Uh, and that's what happens. So it's is. extremely useful, and mm. it's uh, it's good for things like uh, addiction uh, and uh, end of life, as you say, yeah. end of life. Uh, issues, existential anxiety, mm. and I actually think that's where psilocybin is going to find its way uh, into the clinic and into general uses because it can be used in hospice situations, uh, and that doesn't alarm people so much, right? Because oh, okay. oh these people are dying anyway. Who cares? What <laughs> <they do? laughs> it's, it's, it's we can't give them like any that, more but, drugs. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> so that's uh, that's another way that this is going to open up, man. you know. And also, it looks like uh, there's going to, you know, also addictions. It looks like there's mm. going to be there's some rather spectacular uh, work being done at Johns Hopkins right now on smoking cessation. I don't know if you've heard of these, but no. uh, one of Roland Griffith's uh, residents, one of the physicians working on the psilocybin project with him, decided to do uh, see if it helped people quit smoking. And he did a very small study, I think 15 people, okay. but these were serious tobacco addicts. Wow. Lifetime, three-pack a day, wow. tried every kind of way to give it up that they could. You know, these were people who had never taken psychedelics, but were really heavy smokers and and really quite desperate to uh, quit. Yeah, and sure. uh, What's up? No, that's no, okay. No, no, no. Carry on, oh. carry on. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so they wanted to you know, so he gave these people uh, psilocybin, and uh, something like 90% of the people were tobacco-free six months afterwards, uh, really? after one or two psilocybin sessions. So the, the, the second the second question now that people are going to be asking, okay, that sounds all very well and good, but what does it do? Why does it create that result? Is it a, a chemical change, a perspective change, an imagination change, a neurological change? What what is it that creates this 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 yeah this change in people? It is, I think, in the case of psilocybin, in the case of that kind of thing or the addiction kind of thing, uh, kind of treatment. It, right. It's probably a perspective 
change right. more than more than a neurochemical change. Gotcha. It lets people step out of their usual reference right. frame, right? And they look at this thing, they look at this habit that they have, and they look at it in a completely different light. And in That's fact, different. in some of the clinical trials with psilocybin with these smokers, you know, they actually let them smoke you know during the session and in that altered state the act of lighting up the cigarette and smoking it is so disgusting yes yeah. so, you know, they just had a it's like oh my god why am i doing this you know right, this is really right. bad this thing stinks that's it's amazing hurts my body it, you know so you get this perspective on it they come back with that and that really is a powerful uh, entrainment in a way it entrains people it's like aversion therapy it really is totally. like aversion therapy totally. they just come to think of this thing as not something that they want to do and they can think back to their trip you know because the trips are so intense I mean, one, one thing about psychedelic trips you remember them you know generally you remember them because they're impactful yes so they think back to their trip and they think oh, I'm not I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there anymore. So they're mm. able to stay off the that drug, that's you know, amazing. or whatever their drug might be. But tobacco, as you know, and that's the toughest one. It seems to, to be right. I've worked with like years ago. I used to work with quite a few people who with smoking cessation, and 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 again, I've worked with um, a client who 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 used to smoke. I think a pack and a half a day. She'd hid it from her husband for twenty years. Don't know how, mm -hmm. uh, but it took me a couple of sessions to clear it. Right, I'm not saying well, that that's cool, but again, like what you talk about, it's that perspective shift. And with mm -hmm. what, when I'm working with when I used to work with smokers, some people can't get that perspective shift. But with psilocybin, you have no choice. You're right, going you down the ride, right? Shift. You're going like down the ride. Not. Yeah, exactly. And I think that really has a lot to do with uh, you know with its uh, applications in not only uh, tobacco but other substances like uh, opiate addiction. Of course, the drug of choice there is ibogaine. I was about to say ibogaine. Yeah, that seems to be. Is that is that very is that a very different? I don't know too much about ibogaine. Is that a very is that along the suicidal lines or how, how's that? How does that work? Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> it's a psychedelic. Okay. Uh, it but it's different than the others. It hits to a certain degree uh, the 5-HT2A receptors, which are these serotonin receptors that the uh, that the true psychedelics interact with. But it also has other interactions too, gotcha. with other other receptor systems. What seems to be the case with uh, it seems to be something about ibogaine that can specifically interrupt the the craving for opiates that addicts have so wow. they can have this uh iboga experience ibogaine experience right. which is which is heavy it takes three it's three days right what? it yeah it's very long lasting <laughs> so uh it, it's a very long experience not that you're at the peak all the time but for sure. you have a, a long peak and a long uh, coming down period and so you have a lot of opportunity to integrate what's happening to you and reflect on what's happened right, uh, right. and then it puts you in a place where when you're done you don't have any cravings for opiates that that whole withdrawal symptom just is blunted it, it goes away wow and for about a week or ten days you don't have to worry about that and then you've had this this transformative experience right and you if you're smart if you prepare for this you can use that afterglow if you will as a way to change your whole lifestyle you gotcha. know and, and essentially make the changes that will let you make this a sustained response obviously if you go back to your old neighborhood, start hanging out with all your old buddies that right. are shooting smack or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you're gonna fall into it again. Of course. Right? So of you course. have to plan ahead. It's the neurology so that, still. You, you know, you don't go into those habitual That's you know, and, and this is all 
standard addiction science 101. I mean, we know addiction medicine very much like with cocaine, mm -hmm. similar things. You can get off cocaine, you can go into treatment or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the old neighborhood, and you're, you're going to be into it again because habit is a powerful thing. It's the same with everything, right? It's, I, I, yeah. I, I love that, and I, I, I love the shift. So what's Hefter's um, focus? It's so obviously on the psilocybin side, and you're just seeing what happens right now. Is that, is that where you, you grow in this? Well, we've, no, we've got, we've got several studies. Okay. Uh, the... the, the uh, um, the smoking cessation study. We've got a study starting with alcoholics. Oh wow! Uh, we've had a study with uh, uh, on OCD. It oh, seems wow. to be good for OCD. Um, and mm. the the end of life stuff. Beautiful existential anxiety at the end of life. Right. And then actually. Uh, consciousness exploration you know mm -hmm. mystical experiences mm -hmm. which ties into all that psilocybin can reliably induce uh, a mystical experience however okay. you want to define that right. but right. Uh, but so so that's interesting to me in that you don't have to be sick to have a mystical experience it is not right. something that you know, uh, you're looking for a cure, but right. it's something that you might benefit from. And it, sure. it's something that a lot of people spend, you know, their whole lives <laughs> meditating and doing these spiritual disciplines. Yes. Also, they can have one mystical experience. Well, here we have a chemical that will trigger, <laughs> you know, reliably a mystical experience. Reliably. I <laughs> said, said he. So, uh, in the in the Johns Hopkins uh, psilocybin mm -hmm. study, mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a number of them now, but the first right. one on mystical experience, they they don't want to say they don't want to talk about mystical experience, right? That's that's unscientific, for sure, for sure, you know. But they talk about meaningful experiences, oh. something that's personally meaningful, and they have r ways to rate that and measure it. And of the people that in their initial study cohort that, that took psilocybin, about 30%, 35 to 40% said it was the single most mm. meaningful experience of their lives. Mm. And 60% of those of that group said it was okay, it was on, among the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives. <laughs> you know? so, that's not bad. That's not that's bad. pretty interesting. Is that the same study, or maybe it was an earlier study or later, but it's like, I think they interviewed people like 30 years later or something, maybe it was a different study, but they yeah, still that said was it. The, that was the uh, Good Friday experiment. Gotcha, and it was still one of the most profound things that changed their life, right? Absolutely. So I mean, these people were seminarians anyway, so they were right. interested in, in person, you know, a spiritual thing right, right, and becoming right. spiritual counselors to people and that kind of stuff. But it certainly uh, affirmed what they were into, and it, they a lot of them look back on it, uh, you know, as though that was a really important thing for That's them. I don't, I don't know if you've. Uh, seen this movie called Neurons to Nirvana? I've got it on my tab. I'm not joking. I watched the first 15 minutes. It's there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a very good sort of uh, education yes. about the state of the art of psychedelic research right now. Neurons to Nirvana. Yeah. So everyone out there, Nirvana. go and check that out. That's going to educate you massively. Massively. Yeah. It's on Netflix. It turns yes, that's out. what it is. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. So it's easy to, easy to, to find it you don't have to and actually I think it's you know relatively well made and a, and a good a good educational tool it's the kind of thing you could you know you could sit down and, and show your parents or whatever say, yeah. if they're concerned you're a little old for that but uh, yeah, that used you know to me. <laughs> uh, I, I tell my students if you're thinking of using psychedelics or if you use psychedelics and you want to uh, you know, inform your parents in a way about it that won't alarm them too much. This is this is a good thing. Sit For down sure. and watch this. My parents gave up with me a long time ago. They just yeah, let me I, do I, my I thing. Too. They, they figure <laughs> I, I was 
I was a hopeless case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Did so. With, with talking about the spiritual side, we'll talk about this trend in ayahuasca because that's that's a huge trend now. But you do just this is a random random thing. Did you know Ramdas? Back in the uh, day? I met Rob Nas. Yeah, I you knew did. him. I wouldn't say I'm a close friend, but I met him but you met on back, occasions. Yeah, back in the day. Back in the day. Well, wow. not so long ago, but yeah, mm. yeah. That Interesting makes... guy. I mean, I mean, definitely uh, a wise person, and sure. I think he'd be the first to tell you that he benefited from psychedelics. They changed his whole life, yeah, from yeah. being from being yeah. stuck in the bubble of society, thinking his identity as as a Harvard psychologist, and then boom, <laughs> mm-hmm. everything changed. Everything changed. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, what do you, what's your, what's your feeling with this, with this trend with ayahuasca now? Because it seems to be one of the big, the big things that's becoming really popular. I mean, people are heading over to, to, to the, to the Amazon and Machu Picchu to, to do these things. I mean, is that good? It's bad. I mean, what can you tell me about like um, the chemical components of ayahuasca? Why is that different from the suicide journey? I mean, and why is that different from like a DMT flash? And things like that. Why, well, why all- okay, so we we can talk about the the pharmacology of it. Yeah. So uh, ayahuasca again, like psilocybin, it's an orally active form of DMT. You right. can think of it that way. DMT is not orally active, which is why you have to smoke it or snuff it or right. inject it or otherwise take it other than through the gut, right? Because gotcha. the enzymes in the gut will degrade it. The monoamine oxidases are the enzymes that will break it down before gotcha. it ever gets absorbed into gotcha. the bloodstream. Because ayahuasca but, is in every. I mean, DMT is in everything, right? Well, no, it's uh, it's widespread, but it's gotcha. probably not in everything, just okay. almost everything. <laughs> it's certainly in us, and it's in right. many, many, many thousands of plant species. Right. You can't really say it's in everything. Okay. It might be at very low levels. Okay. I have a personal theory that it is in everything, right. but I haven't done the experiment to verify that. For sure, um, for I sure. I can't get, fu- you know, you can't. Night is not going to fund a study to, okay, let's go out and grab every plant we can see and start analyzing it. Because I think they're afraid that you'd find that actually it is in everything. Uh, right. But right. not at useful levels. Uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, but, but ayahuasca is made from the two plants, one mm-hmm. of which contains the DMT. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of sources of that. Okay. But then this vine, Banisteriopsis copy, contains uh, okay. these beta carboline alkaloids, which are very strong and specific inhibitors of monoamine oxidase. So take those two plants, the bark of Banisteriopsis, the leaf of Psychotria, or gotcha. which is called, boil them up together and you get an orally active preparation. Wow. So that's the that's the pharmacology of it, and it's essentially it's DMT. It's a it's a uh, you know it it's a way to experience DMT. It totally obviously changes the pharmacokinetics of it. So instead of a ten or fifteen minute experience, like when you smoke it, it's right. It's a few hours. It's usually six or seven hours. Right. Sometimes much longer. Sometimes somewhat shorter. Okay. Everybody's different. Right. So, why is it getting so popular? Yeah. That is a good question. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, you, you could go down the path with it. It's, it's actually the consciousness of the plant coming through. Um, you, again, what? Yeah. What? You, what's your theory? I, well, uh, my theory uh, is kind of that, that we're actually involved in a kind of uh, a co-evolutionary relationship with ayahuasca and indeed with all plants, with the whole biosphere that we interact with. But ayahuasca, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a scientific state, but this is a, <laughs> this is a personal sort of yeah. way to think of it. And I think of ayahuasca... I think of all nature as intelligent. I'm essentially a pantheist or a, uh, an animist. I, I think that consciousness is built into the structure of nature. I agree. I think nature is is conscious. And, yes. You know, I'm a believer of the in the Gaia hypothesis yes, yes, idea. Yes. 
I think the as Gaia, I think the community of species, the 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 biosphere, if you will, is getting quite alarmed at what we're doing to the planet. And I think basically they delegated mm. ayahuasca, right. which has been in a coevolutionary relationship with with uh, indigenous societies oh. for thousands of yeah. years. But finally, you know, the orders came from up the line and yep. said, look, you need to get out on the global stage <laughs> and start to talking to people because these monkeys are really screwing things <laughs> up, you know, and this um, is a wake-up call. Yes, and that's I essentially, agree. it's amazing to me how many people, you know, are going to the Amazon and in search of, they're not sure what, yes. you know, but they want, they have this, I think, deep longing to have a meaningful experience and to to connect with nature and and you know ayahuasca exemplifies all that about nature you know it comes from the jungle it's you know right. deep and earthy right. i mean it's about as herbal as it gets right i mean this <laughs> sure. is this is a plant man all the way or actually a couple plants but people right, right. feel that impulse to connect with uh you know this this living intelligent being, and uh, and uh, right. you know they have a desire for a meaningful experience uh, mm. because they're not getting it in our society. Mm. You know, I mean, most people look at uh, many people turn to religion for right. meaningful experiences, but religious institutions. Established religions are pretty much hollowed out shells. <laughs> There's nothing in them. No, I agree. There's nothing in them anymore. No. And and a, a mystical experience, they're terrified of that. It's they're, a business. They're set up to make sure that nobody has anything like that. You know, we can't <laughs> handle that. That's, you know, that's I true. mean that that totally you know undermines the authority of the right. priesthood and right. the priests are, right. you know, the priests will tell you what to think. You can't go out and talk to. God directly. You can't go out and take a plant and talk totally. to God. I mean, that's totally. completely heretical, you know. So that's the disconnect uh, that they keep the control with, right? That's the whole yeah. point. And and so people sense that, and they they want to break out of that. And they mm. so I think ayahuasca has this great, you know, sort of romantic attraction. People can, you know, I, I mean, I think one of the myths in some ways that permeate. Uh, the counterculture and have since the since the late sixties is the whole Don Juan thing, you know, right. the teachings of Don Juan. Right. Even though we know most of that was made up mm -hmm. and it's fake now, mm -hmm. but the idea still is powerful. The idea that you would go out and seek a teacher yes. and learn the mysteries yes. and all that. People want that. They want that. They want that. So ayahuasca is perfect because it gives you a chance to. You know, go to the Amazon, go to the jungle, have this experience. I mean, never mind that, you know, your experience is being handled by a tour company that's arranging everything for you and charging enormous bucks. You know, it still, still has awesome. that. I mean, you, you're perfectly free to do that on your own. You don't have to yeah. go through that. You can, you know, if you're low budget, and in some ways it's better if you just go off on your own. You know, but the ayahuasca scene in South America is such a, I mean, it's the Wild West now, so you right. have to be a little careful. Isn't there, isn't there like a, a, a version of Yelp, basically? Like Yelp, it's like for ayahuasca for the actual, because I know there's, there's people have had issues over there with the shamans. And also, there's, you know, when there's money involved, it doesn't, you, you, it brings ego. And when the ego comes... Anytime it, you have, exactly, anytime you have money involved... No. I mean, all spiritual traditions become corrupted. Really? I don't think they're, I think it's in the nature of them. And uh, mm. but that doesn't mean that all practitioners are corrupt. And, no, not at all. You know, so you have to, you have to kind of know the ropes to sort it out, to know who to go to, who not to go to, right. how to, you know, prepare and how to protect yourself. Yeah, there are definitely abuses. I, mm. I don't see this as any difference than spiritual pilgrims back in the 60s were going to India to find the guru and you know and to the guru it was great I mean it was all about <laughs> the money and the chicks right I mean that was right. basically it it was it same dynamic is happening now mm, interesting. you know 
but not everybody, you know, so so you can't make blanket judgment. Yeah, Absolutely. there's people there who that's, you know, that's what they are, and they need to be identified and outed and avoided. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are more ethical uh, mm -hmm. need to be, that also needs to be promoted in a sense. But it's, it's a fine line, though, because... And this is a fascinating phenomenon. You've got a, you've got an indigenous tradition around a plant, you know, and then you've got this global culture coming in, and and we know from it, other anthropology, every time you have a more powerful economically an alien culture essentially impacting an indigenous culture, both are going to be changed. Right. Right. And usually the indigenous culture is the one that's going to come out on the short end. I mean, that's historically all yep. how it's always been. Yep. You know, uh, although in the case of ayahuasca, it may actually, there may be a chance that that won't happen because one thing ayahuasca does give you is a sense of, uh, you know, a moral and ethical sense, a sense of the fairness and a sense of right. the you know, the connection between all living things right. and certain, you know, respect for the people that have been the stewards of this tradition for it's all beautiful. this time. You know, I mean, we, we respect them at the same time we're destroying their culture, but, <laughs> right. you know. But, the, but everything's but, perfect, but maybe right? There's a, maybe there's a bigger, uh, yes. you know, bigger fish here to yes. fry, the fact that ayahuasca has gone, gone global, you know. Uh, I really do believe in, uh, you know, plant intelligence. It's Absolutely. not the same as ours, but I do think that this is uh, a phenomenon where basically, uh, you know, if you want to attribute that kind of intelligence to to Gaia, Gaia is saying, you know, uh, we have to educate the monkeys about really? our connection yeah. to about their connection to nature and they're 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 laboring under at least two thousand years wow. of Judeo Christian tradition which has taught us to not value nature. In fact reject nature. Interesting. Devalue it. Interesting. Uh, devalue everything that has you know that is part of the natural world, nature itself, our own bodies, our own life. It, and the whole emphasis of these, uh, you know, these uh, Western religious traditions, which basically have come out of tribal traditions, right. ultimately patriarchal tribal tradition. Right. But the emphasis is all about what happens in the next life, right? Don't value this life. That's interesting. That's not where your reward is. I've never thought about it like that. So the next life. Mm, you're right, you're right. It's always about, again, it's the getting to God. It's yeah, not about exactly. understanding so, that we're inside of God. It's not understanding that we are the these, um, yeah, we're still, we're still, the, you are, you're right, we're still these monkeys. We're still so close to monkeys that, that we, because the ego kicks in. And, and, and these, these religions are theistic, right? These mm. religions are all about, there's us, we're and we stand outside, and then there's God, right? Is not part of nature. It's something that well, right? We can't they touch. Created nature, but we're we're not part of it. Which is yeah. the total opposite of the indigenous tradition, which is pantheism and animism. Yeah. The universe is God. It is not separate from God. It is God. It and is. animism is the idea that. Everything is intelligent. Everything has a spiritual aspect or a soul, you know, yes. from the from the rocks to the trees right. to the right. you know natural phenomenon and so on. That's beautiful. That's the indigenous worldview. I mm -hmm. I believe that that worldview is informed by the psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you take psychedelics, these don't become beliefs. These become empirical observations. <laughs> you see it. If, you see it. Yes. You don't have to believe it because you no. see it. That's right? it. And once and you see it, you can't. It's like it's like reading a story or a book. You can't go back. You can't delete it out of your head. You, you cannot unsee it once you see <laughs> no, it. You definitely that's, can't. That's the that's the whole thing. So uh, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. So so these become essentially not a belief system, but uh, you know the psychedelics open your 
perception to a different way of looking at the world. Beautiful. And uh, in that sense, I think they're very powerful as yeah. far as changing. And this is what has to happen, you know, if the monkeys are going to wake up, if we're going to make steps hope so. to change, to turn this situation around, you have to change consciousness. Because in our culture, nature just, in the first place, we don't see ourselves as part of nature. You know? And of course, we are part of nature, and the <laughs> fact that we're forgetting that is mm -hmm. one of the big problems. Right. Nature is here for us to own and exploit, mm -hmm. and the religious, you know, <sighs> organized yeah. religious reinforce that idea that nature is here to serve us. No, we do not run things. We are not running things. You know, nature is running us. Oh, sure. And nature <laughs> is quite a lark because we're out of control. We're like, yeah. you know, a juvenile delinquent. And we have, uh, you know, we have control with and access to technologies uh, that can have a great impact on the stability of the planet. And so they quickly. are. In fact. So quickly. So we have to wake up first, and that, that's what they're about. They're and trying to wake us up. I, I, I truly believe that too. I, I, I really do. And I, I, So is, that, is this what your, your book's about? The, the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss? I mean, it's a no. hell of a title, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> it's, it's not really about that. I mean, it's, it's somewhat about that, but okay. it's, uh, it's really a memoir. It's, uh, oh. Its subtitle is... Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, My Life with Terence McKenna. So it's about our growing up together and our all these oh, crazy wow. ideas. And so obviously it explores some of that, but it's wow. really uh, just, a, just a memoir. It's just a story of, you know, what got these two weird, nerdy boys from, from you know, this small town in Colorado that got interested in all this weird stuff and wow. you know we were already pretty interested in weird stuff i can thank my father for a lot of that oh, because really? well he was a totally normal person he was completely invested in the idea of being a normal ordinary joe okay fact, okay his name was joe but <laughs> that's was very much but the thing is uh, he wasn't normal. He wasn't ordinary. We used to get into arguments about this when I was a teenager because he'd say, you know, Dan, the average guy, he was always going on about the average guy. And I'm saying, but Dad, you're not an average guy. You know, and why would you want to be an average guy? Who right. wants to be average? Right. You know, I said, you're a remarkable person. Mm -hmm. You know, you do things that your friends who are much more normal than you are never do. He always was sort of in denial about that. Interesting. You know, of the, being the average guy. But but the thing that, I mean, the thing that he did, he would bring science fiction books home. He was, he would bring, uh, he was interested in science, science fiction. And Terrence and I got all over that. Oh, and he was interested, he would bring home Fate magazine sometimes, which oh, was wow. a magazine still being published, but it was all about the paranormal and UFOs and, uh, right. you know, the abominable snowman and all this crazy stuff, That's right? Cool. Uh, ESP and so on. And we right. were all over that. And he read them. Right. I don't know how seriously he took them. He wasn't obsessed with these things. But... You know, Terrence and I, man, we jumped all over that, and, and we got totally interested in in that. And I'd have to say that science fiction uh, was a big uh, was a big influence there, and and still is actually. I love really? science fiction, and really? I think science fiction helps people think in broader strokes about stuff. You know, sure. within that context. And so I. Um, yeah, and, and, and so then when we were teenagers, we were yeah. interested in these things and we were discovering things like Jungian psychology and, right. and shamanism and then psychedelics came along and about in the middle of all this, we thought, oh, well, you know, actually here's something that all these extra dimensions and, you know, right. things they talk about in science fiction, this is actually real. <laughs> I'm seeing and touching these things. actually go to other dimensions. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Guaranteed every time. Yeah. 
So wow. really, what, what pushed us into this, as much as the cultural uh, influences of the time, and we were we were in a small town in Colorado, and we were uh, subjected to that as much. But then my brother went to Berkeley, uh, you know, to school. He actually left uh, Paonia, Colorado, and did his last two years of high school out in in uh, the Bay Area. Oh. And so he was subject to a lot of influences that I wasn't, and I was sort of left behind oh. in this podunk town, but he was sent, he was telegraphing messages back, sure. as it were, and sure. we found a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sort of mutual interests in all this. Wow. So that, that was the genesis of it, but, but what motivated us to in investigate this was simply curiosity, you know, just mm -hmm. scientific curiosity, really. And, wow. Uh, which is which is always legitimate. I mean, curiosity is what pushes pushes science forward. That's everything, so, right? So once you can expand that 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 um, your imagination, and that's what people again. I always had this concept about imagination. I don't know a lot of people do, it, but it, with imagination, everything starts there. Everything begins there. And people just don't think it's real, and it is very real. It's very real. I mean, right. I, when I take people into trance using doing hypnosis and NLP. Guess what? The experience that they have in there, they pop out the other side and it changes their life. Is that not real? Well, now it's got a scientific term behind it. Well, and mm. now I get paid good money to help people, but it's the same thing. You're playing in people's imaginations. You're unlocking possibilities. You're unlocking um, new new perspectives. And so, it, it, is the imagination well, real or like not? The, like the point that Jung was, was <clears throat> often made, <laughs> Just because it's an idea doesn't mean that it's not real. Ideas are as real as, you know, this here. I right. mean, it's a different kind of reality. And so, uh, you know, we get into some funny, you know, some, I mean, the terminology trips us up, right? right. Because it's something real, right. not real. Is right. it inside? Is it outside? Right. That's all illusion. You know, we're see. living in a hallucination right now which is the hallucination created by our neurochemistry. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, we're in a neurochemical brain state at all points. We yeah. don't live in reality. Never, never. We live in a model of reality. Mm -hmm. you know, That's exactly. That sort of, we think, mm -hmm. more or less corresponds to an external reality, but mm -hmm. it, it's not the same, and, and you it's know, physics same. tells us that external reality doesn't look anything like the reality that we're surrounded with that, that no. seems to most of the time make sense and we can navigate in it. And then we can change the channel, right? We can yes. use these different neurotransmitter substances. Right. We can change the channel. Right. And guess what? The signal is modulated and then suddenly we see aspects of reality that uh, we didn't see before. And I think that's a lot of what psychedelics do. They right. they essentially change the the figure the the, the figure ground relationship. Hmm. So you know we're we're evolutionarily and, and perceptually uh, conditioned to uh, actually filter out most of what comes into Absolutely. us because we can't handle it. Right. That's no, correct. Yeah. It, it uh, we have this gating this sensory gating mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mechanism, which has been well studied in sure. neurophysiology. And in your your things... reticular activating system, your RAS, you know, we're taking in right. over 2 million bits of information through our five senses. It gets chunked down to 134,000 bits. That's all we can see. Where's That's the rest of it? See, it's, right. our, it's, it's everywhere. But yeah. we don't see it. And you, you've done neurolinguistics, right. so you know this very well. For sure. Right? And this and is what... the thing. Yeah. Psychedelics temporarily give you the... the they lower uh, this gating threshold mm -hmm. so that suddenly things that you normally ignore or suppress, right. they come to the foreground. And suddenly that's why you can spend six hours staring at a rose or something. It's like, oh my God, I never actually looked at a rose I never before. Saw. You know, I never so saw. they give people this <laughs> novel way to, to uh, you know, to see things. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, I'm. No, no, I don't we're gonna know have to wind up. No, 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 no. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, for sure, make. for sure. 
it's yeah, um, Dennis. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much for spending this time. It's been, it's been, yeah, it's really, really appreciate. It. It's been such a, it's definitely a tick on my bucket list connecting with you, sir. Honestly, uh, we barely touch I know. what we can talk about. But I know. I'd be happy to come back. I'd love that. And anyway, I, I'm definitely going to be posting. Every, I'm going to be doing an intro and an outro to this. My, my 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 listeners are used to me ranting on with this, so I'm going to be heavily promoting your book. I'm going to go and buy it now, and I'm going to put it everywhere. And um, I'm fascinated with your journey. And I um, yeah, I'm looking forward to connecting you really really soon, Dennis. Really am. Okay. Well, we we can circle back on it for sure. Love to. Love to. Uh, yeah. I'm, send me the link when you got it, and uh, we can we can definitely do this again. This is awesome. You're a good interviewer, so I Thank enjoy you, that. That's you appreciated. Have <laughs> a good day. Bye bye. Ciao for now. Ciao absolutely. For now. Absolutely. Bye bye, mate. Bye bye.